Thank you, Will. And really nice to see so many people here. Um, so my job today is just to chair and kind of facilitate a little bit. The reason that I'm here is I'm the MESTO lead for the UK Reproducibility Network, which is a, um, a UK wide network, which enables collaboration between researchers, institutions, other interested stakeholders to sort of conduct and promote rigorous, reproducible and transparent research. So really relevant to what we're thinking about here today. The UKRN consists of about 32 member universities, one of which is Leicester, um, 76 local networks, um, which are comprised of uh, institutionally based researchers and 54 stakeholder organizations too. So that includes people like um, funders, publishers, men's societies and other academic and sectoral groups who are interested in, um, in open research. UKRN is leading the Open Research Programme with a consortium of 22 partner institutions who are supported by Research England, looking to accelerate the uptake of high quality research practices. And it also offers support to initiatives like Reproducibility, which we have here at Leicester, a very active journal club interested in open research, like uh, Octopus AC and the Open Research Calendar. And they run lots of monthly webinars like this one. Now, our key subject today is um, antibodies, their role in biomedical and biological research, and their position as a potential driver of irreproducibility in research. We know there's lots of possible reasons for that and changes to the research environment are really important for moving forward and creating change. So without further ado, um, we'll begin with um, our one o'clock talk, um, which is from Dr. Harvin de Verk, who's a clinical lecturer in respiratory sciences at University of Leicester and a previous MRC clinical research training fellow. And with Harv is Dr. Michael Biddle, a research associate also from the University of Leicester, both of them part of the Only Good Antibodies community, which was set up to try and address the research culture and environment issues that, um, that they're going to be talking about, I think. Um, Harv and Michael, please go for it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, can you hear, hear and see me okay? Perfect. So um, I'm so grateful to the UK Reproducibility Network for hosting us to Carl from Icarus for joining us on this platform and Anita from RRID. It's just wonderful to have this opportunity to talk about this issue with a broad range of stakeholders. I know not all of you will be from biomedical research and what we want to do is bring you into our space, bring you into our world and help you understand how our issue is actually very similar probably to a number of issues that you have and is probably driven by lots of the same types of issue. And I think that there's plenty of scope for us to get together and start to address some of the research culture and environment factors together. And I think it's great that open science is well represented here because one of the key solutions we think is open science. So my name's Harvind de Berk. Um, Sarah introduced me. This is, this is Michael Biddle. And um, I, I, unfortunately, Eva Krokow can't be here because she's looking after her very young baby. She's, she's uh, a co-lead of the Only Good Antibodies community. And Michael's kindly stepped in while, while she's on maternity leave. So uh, given this is a reproducibility network and uh, an open science network, I need to be open about my conflicts of interest. But I'd actually like to start by being quite open about Ogre's lack of conflict in one particular space, we're not making antibodies, we're not selling antibodies, we just want to improve how antibodies are used in research. What we do do, however, is work with all of the stakeholders. So we do work with antibody manufacturers, we do work with Icarus, with RRID, we are engaging with research funders, we're engaging with publishers. And uh, that's important because without doing that, you can't make change. And I, I declare it as a conflict, but I also think it's a strength. Our funding at the moment comes from a tiny bit from the uh, Structural Genomics Consortium, which is an international collaboration uh, about open science and proteomics. Uh, the Leicester Institute has given us a, a little bit of money to get going, and we've got a couple of awards from the BBSRC just to, to get going. Um, so what are we going to talk about? So because this is quite a broad uh, audience, I'm going to start by trying to explain what antibodies are and why they're important. Since COVID, it appears that perhaps more people are aware of antibodies, at least in relation to human health. They're also used as an important tool. And I will try and explore why they're important to research and why ultimately they might be important to clinical research and clinical translation, going from an idea to a treatment. I'm gonna give some examples of, of problems and their impacts. Um, 
but I won't go into lots of technical detail. Carl is the technical expert on this one, and he's the one who's going to take on the slightly bigger challenge of, of, of the, the technical problems. And then we're going to just talk about models of working with stakeholders. And I think Carl, again, uh, and Anita, Anita in relation to, to publishers, Carl in relation to manufacturers, have excellent examples of working together with the different stakeholders to try and make progress. And we're trying to, to, to embed ourselves in that process. And we'll talk about the research as well as personal experience of the different dimensions that likely drive this problem. There isn't a lot of research out there, so that won't be a long section, but we do need to understand and we need to work out uh, where there's scope to work together because I, I suspect a lot of the drivers of this individual problem are the same as the drivers of other problems that we talk about. I think Anita might mention cell lines as well, which it's an, a related issue, uh, but I, there are lots of issues and there are lots of common factors. And we'll start to talk, and, and then I'll, I'll probably finish by tentatively introducing some of the solutions. Carl and Anita will talk more about the solutions. We're the bad guys who talk about problems. So um, antibodies. Um, a lot of antibodies, at least the ones in, in our immune systems, look like Y-shaped y proteins. And they've got a bit on the end that's meant to detect a target specifically. And if that's COVID, that antibody helps your body fight COVID. But in the lab, what we what, why we use it is because it helps us find a protein and label a protein and study that protein. Where is it expressed? Is it expressed more in a disease? Is it expressed more in health? Could we manipulate that protein? Could we target it with a drug? Um, um, but the analogy I use, and it's a gross oversimplification, but the idea is that you're, you're looking for uh, a needle in a haystack, but a haystack can be different sizes. That haystack can include lots of things that might look a bit like the needle you're looking for, but isn't the needle you, you're looking for. And actually, the way you use an antibody needs to be tested for the specific application you're using it in, and when you do these tests, Carl will talk about this, a lot of the time you don't find that they work uh, robustly for the application of interest. I think it's worth mentioning that antibodies are used in research, but they're also used as drugs and they're also used as biomarkers. And the, the different regulatory frameworks for each of these. So a research use only antibody can sometimes be sold, one company that makes them can sell them to another company that makes them. And historically, they haven't always been very transparent about two vendors are selling effectively the same product. Um, lots of vendors do offer re refunds if a product doesn't work as advertised. You have to test that it hasn't worked as advertised. They're generally not patented. So they uh, people are not investing the money they need uh, money into protecting the intellectual property behind a research use antibody, but they often do if it's a therapeutic antibody or a biomarker. I have uh, updated my slides since a meeting in Bath to, to broaden the number of antibodies that we think are out there. We don't, uh, so I, and Anita's probably a better uh, person to estimate the number of antibodies out there. I've heard some estimates as low as 2 million, and I've heard some estimates as high as 8 million recently, um, but whether they're all unique and different, that's a different question. Um, it is a core tool in every biomedical research lab. These antibodies are used in pharma. Uh, people developing drugs use antibodies to help understand disease mechanisms, to help make models of disease, and help to study disease mechanisms and treatments. And some of them eventually become the basis for diagnostic tests and treatments, although most of them live in a in the research use only space. Um, so why are they important? So these tools are absolutely key to ask disease mechanism questions, to ask questions about what proteins might be important of, in disease. And as such, they form part of the bottleneck in discovery. If you don't have a good antibody to study your potential protein of study uh, of interest, you can't study it. And I think um, Carl does a lot of work in terms of dark proteins. And by dark proteins, I mean proteins that haven't really been studied very much. And 
And some of these haven't been studied very much because the tools to robustly study them aren't out there. And that's a way in which the, a lack of high quality reagents represents a bottleneck. But we, but Carl's work also, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll stop telling people all about Carl's work. Uh, he, he'll tell, tell us his stuff. Uh, but this is a massive barrier. Um, we can't do clinical research and discover meaningful results that result in changes to patient lives if research is not reproducible. And I'd point people to a fantastic documentary by Mike Okimoto, where, and, and I'll, I'll post this at the end, uh, where he interviews Glenn Begley, who in 2012 did a seminal piece of research where he tried to reproduce some really important findings from the biomedical research literature and was only able to do six or seven out of 53. I don't quote me on the number, but ultimately there was a, a very high failure rate of trying to reproduce key important findings of important studies. How did I end up down this rabbit hole as a doctor? So I applied for some money um, to do a PhD. Uh, that was the MRC Clinical Research Training Committee. And I had some really exciting preliminary data using an antibody that this protein called TRIP-A1 might be important in severe asthma. I had a whole bunch of biopsies that were stained with an antibody that seemed to suggest it was really different in severe asthma uh, rather than in uh, health. And then I, I came across a very helpful PI who suggested, you know what, he, he's looked at these channels before and he, he, he's not sure about the antibodies. I should go away and look at them in more detail. And I, and I did. I uh, produced some positive and negative controls. I'll let Carl talk about that in more detail. The positive and negative controls I, I used were not perfect. There are better ones available and Carl uses better ones. But actually, they were good enough for me to say that the three most used antibodies in the literature for this protein, two of them didn't detect TRIP-A1 in commonly used assays. And one of them detected TRIP-A1, but detected a bunch of whole other set of proteins as well. We then went on and found a couple that could detect TRIP-A1 and then did a bunch of validation to check that they could measure TRIP-A1 in some cell types I was interested in. But it actually turned out that the core cell type that was the basis of my fellowship proposal, mast cells, didn't even express this, this particular protein. So that sort of sounds like a negative story, but there were lots of positive impacts of doing the validation work. Uh, Abcams um, changed the recommendations on their website to say this anti one of these antibodies isn't suitable for use in human samples, and people aren't using it anymore. There are databases to, to track this and a niche will talk about those. But um, people aren't using that particular antibody anymore. There are a bunch of databases. There's now information on those databases. And if you know how to access these that information, you will realize there are better and worse choices to be made here. And that they can help you find better choices. And there are now 13 papers that used what I would describe as a better choice. And those antibodies have previously not been used before. And some in the, in the therapeutic space have gone on to develop new antibodies, and they've cited my work as a reason for going away from doing that. Interestingly, some people have asked questions about long-held beliefs, for example, about uh, cardiomyocytes and this protein, and they've been able to question this um, because they replicated our findings, the antibodies don't actually detect TRIP-A1, and they were able to publish important negative findings, suggesting that TRIP-A1 was not in heart cells. And that's important because people are worried when they're developing drugs against TRIP-A1, which are in phase two trials, about possible side effects by their effect on the heart. Now, this isn't a isolated story. Um, people are still using antibodies that may not be selective, and it's been published about uh, again and again. Um, Monia Baker's done a great job of highlighting this issue. She's a, she's a journalist who was based at Nature, and Simon Goodman um, is another person who's done a fantastic job of raising awareness of this issue and starting to address it. But just the, some of these uh, papers go back 10 years, um, and there's, there's uh, fantastic examples of millions of dollars of research money. So this antibody, um, uh, this estrogen receptor beta research Eastern receptor beta was thought to be an important biomarker for breast cancer. 
And when someone went away and did the robust antibody validation, it, it turned out it might not be in, in most of the breast cancers that we thought were, it was, that it was there. Um, this particular article uses the word lax to describe biomedical researchers. Here's, here's a retraction notice. Um, we use the, inadvertently, uh, people have used the word blame and, and there's been a bit of finger pointing. And I, I think a core part of Anita, Peter, uh, Carl's approach to solving this issue is to work with stakeholders and to stop pointing fingers because pointing fingers stops people from working together. And generally speaking, most people are trying to do a good job. They're trying to produce good products. They're trying to do good research. And actually, um, by using, when you, when you use blame, you end a conversation and you end the curiosity about what's driving this problem, what, what can be done about it. And that's sort of the start point for our, our community. Uh, we're the only good antibody community forum. We want to work with people and not point fingers. And we want to increase the availability and promote the use of high quality performing antibodies. And I think the, the work that people like Carl do helps people understand what a high quality antibody is. And we just want to make sure that that data has its maximum impact. And what we've recognized is that this is a, it's, it's a behavior issue in, in the sense that people need to change their behavior. It's a research culture issue and it's a research environment issue. And it involves a lot of different stakeholders coming together and not just engaging with them. We need to coordinate and coordination isn't easy. Um, uh, there's a lot of different moving parts. And I think I'll, I've talked about the negative, story, but th th there's an important positive here. If we can start to address this issue, there's going to be more good antibodies discovered. And these good antibodies are critical. Some of them are treatments. Pembrolizumab is the basis for immunotherapy. Now that's a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, new type of treatment that is extending the lives of patients with, for example, non small cell lung cancer, which previously had a terrible prognosis and people are living longer. Um, these antibodies, so that that's the drug, but there's another antibody that's used to recognize whether a patient's appropriate for that. Treatment. And that antibody uh, is help uh, clinicians decide uh, who receives this therapy. And that makes money for industry, it generates tax. Um, so we started this and just to really sell, uh, sell the point, uh, sorry, we didn't start this. I, I'd argue that uh, Anita, Carl, we're, we're joining and we're helping. Um, but ultimately, uh, a lack of tools are a major barrier to discovery. Money's wasted, patient samples are wasted, uh, animals are wasted in research, animals are wasted in the production of antibodies that are not performing. The data can mislead entire fields of research. And uh, bad data has implications for individual scientists who for often no fault of their own have ended up publishing data that might not be reproducible. So, what are the potential drivers of this problem? So quality control of the reagents, that, that's a, a potential driver. Um, we, we went to a conference in Bath where the companies came and I, I was really encouraged that s some of those in-house processes are, are improving, but also there are now mechanisms to, to look at it, uh, quality control independently. And I, I think that's a, an important thing to do, but it's an enormous task. Um, we don't know how many antibodies there are out there. Anita might uh, tell us more clearly, but it's somewhere between two and eight million. Um, and robust controls take time and money. And we think that money is really uh, well invested because it makes the rest of research more reliable, but we're gonna have to convince people. Um, there are different technologies to make antibodies. Injecting mice and harvesting their blood, that blood can in include lots of different types of antibody that vary lot to lot. And then there are newer technologies that are, we call them recombinant, where you use uh, DNA technologies to, to generate these antibodies. And we think that those are, perform well and are more reproducible. Um, but the community is not adopting these new, the new technologies. The vendors tell us that actually, if, if an antibody, a polyclonal antibody is, uh, is a bestseller, it will stay a bestseller even if you find data to say that something else might work better. And that's part of what we want to do. Um, and 
Then another factor is, is the prevailing research culture and environment in the sense that even if there's good data out there, you need to show, ideally in your own hands, in your own experimental setting, in your own cells, that the antibody is fit for, for that specific purpose. And that requires people to do some experiments in their own hands. And there's not a lot of data out there about why people do or don't do certain experiments. And I, I, th I think I was going to, at this point, introduce Michael to tell his story uh, about why he did these experiments and the different factors that he faced. And then I'll try and introduce a limited amount of research that does exist in this area. So in my PhD, I was asked to study the noxious new protein and the recycling protocol. On the right is just one application was testing antibodies. Uh, Michael, this is Carl. My, Mike, this is Carl. We don't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Is that better? That's better. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so on my PhD, I was tasked to look at seven proteins. And on the right is just one application where I was testing 12 antibodies for one protein target. And on the right, it's just showing that two out of those 12 were capable of detecting NOX4, which is the protein name, by flow cytometry, which was the application. Now, this is, took over two years of my PhD, and that's just because availability of antibodies. Um, and also, NOX4 is a very tricky protein in terms of validation itself, because it's a um, cell membrane protein, which is very hard to study. So there was a lot of issues I took overcome as a result of this. So there's conflicting issues, which was I was aware that this would be hard to publish because the people reviewing any publication related to this, I would essentially say these antibodies weren't working, which they may or may have not used in their own research. Um, there was also a lot of pressure, and this was also self-inflicted because I was aware of what I wanted to achieve for my PhD, and this was setting me back in terms of what I could possibly get out from it. Um, as a result, it created a work-life balance. Um, you know, I was struggling to, as I was aware that I was falling behind in what I wanted to achieve, I was doing a lot more work and putting my life, you know, my, um, my outside of work life in the background. And as a result of this, I was also very concerned about my future career um, because inevitably papers result in my prospects being better. Um, so as I said, publications are critical for my career progression and that will be impact factor as well as number of publications and as a result these data sets are actually very hard to get out there and if they do go out it's usually often put in a supplement of another you know more interesting story um, and the research culture doesn't promote this kind of validation yet and there's multiple reasons for that it's um which is impact factor drives usually career progression and as a result a lot of validation data is put on hold to drive you know to focus on you know better papers in terms of potential impact factor or easier papers to get out. And a CV essentially requires both of them. Um, Ogre is currently trying to work on a reward scheme for, you know, databases and stuff on antibody characterization to go out there. So there is a new, you know, we're trying to push a reward, which isn't there currently. So I guess the question is, why did I choose to validate knowing that this could impede my career? And it's mainly, one of the main reasons is the current data I was generating just didn't make sense. Um, in the literature, TGF beta, which is a protein, is shown to increase the protein of interest I was looking at, and I could not replicate that. Um, so in, in, instantly, I wanted to just figure out why that was the case. Um, I'm quite lucky. Uh, I don't think many people have the background which I stumbled upon. Uh, in my education, in my undergrad, I was told about, I was exposed to bad antibodies and it led me to read further literature and how to validate and characterize them, um, making me more aware from when my PhD started, but I don't think that's reflected in many undergraduate schemes. And we are also working on trying to develop this more into an undergraduate program. Um, I was also lucky in my PhD because I was supported by my supervisors to allow me to go away and characterize these antibodies. And this was done through Lentivirus, which is various molecular biology tools, and I had training in that. And there's a positive aspect of characterization, which some people may overlook, which is you develop uh, better resilience, you have more reproducible data, which I think is critical 
in this research field. But also I've developed more collaborations and novel findings as a result. So there is definitely a payoff to be an initially setback. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thank you for sharing what can be a little bit of a difficult story. And it that that's a personal story, but what data is out there to really understand whether people do validation, how they do validation, and unfortunately, a key question is why they don't do validation. Um, actually, Michael did a, a literature search associated with a, a group of antibodies and found that 88% of papers were not presenting meaningful validation data in immunofluorescence, for example. So people aren't doing the validation, so why not? And this uh, publication from the RIM lab is the results of a survey that were associated with a, in 2016, a whole bunch of stakeholders got together to try and deal with this issue. And they tried to come up with some uh, consensus actions. And we're trying to pick, pick that up and try and uh, carry that uh, initiative forward. That was back in Asilomar in, in California. And, and this was the survey that they successfully distributed to about uh, 500 uh, respondents, uh, mostly more senior researchers actually, and less, less senior researchers. And the, the barriers were similar to some of the stories that um, Michael was telling. So people felt it took too much time, that it was too expensive, and it delayed their research. And obviously, um, in reality, it's expensive to not validate, and actually it's a complete waste of time to not validate. But in the current research environment and culture, which is about high impact papers published within a certain time frame, so you can get your next post, that these factors play into people's mind despite the big picture. And some people felt they weren't supported and some people felt that it wasn't necessary. Um, and when they go about choosing antibodies, they said literature citations were, were key. Um, the, there wasn't really much more information uh, about what that meant. Um, some people looked for data in the type of experiment they were doing, and a lot of people look at Western blots because that's a very common type of data. And they extrapolate from a Western blot what the performance might be in others. And actually, that might not be the best predictor either. So we, we've started doing some further re qualitative research to get some in-depth understanding using focus groups. And our focus groups to date have focused on early career researchers and PhD students who are the ones in the lab doing the experiments and actually quite frequently are the ones to make the decision about which antibody to buy. And what factors did, did they use to help them decide which antibody to buy? And quite high up on that was vendor reputation. So it's not looking for data, validation data, it's looking for this vendor, I'm told by my supervisor or someone has an excellent reputation, we'll buy from them. The next thing they looked at was the perceived quality or number of citations in the literature. So that's not looking for specific characterization data, that's saying this was an important paper in the field, which antibody did they use? or is this antibody very highly used? And unfortunately, myself and several other people have found that citations are not a always a good predictor of performance. You kind of have to do the validation work. I've, I've mentioned a few other things that people mentioned there, but I'll, I'll move on for the, in the interest of time to those barriers that they perceived in validation. And our focus group show similar to, to the survey results in, in uh, the RIM uh, paper which is that awareness is an issue, incentive is an issue. That didn't necessarily come up so much in, in the survey, but a survey doesn't, if a survey doesn't ask her a question, you don't get an answer, while a focus group gives you that slightly richer set. So it was the reward system doesn't, doesn't reward doing what is a critical experiment, which is wrong, but we need to try and change reward systems potentially to, to address that. And time and costs came up again. And then if you want to change behavior, you need buy-in from the end user. I'm not an expert in behavior change. Um, I, I, I rely on our behavioral scientist who's on maternity and Sarah is volunteering to step in uh, while she's gone. But um, what, what we need is buy-in from the end user. And what do end users think might represent a solution in this area? 
and they felt like awareness and education were key and they felt like trusted data sharing was key. Trust in this space has been eroded by uh, the various different problems that have occurred and we need to build trust. Um, and I think the others might talk a little bit about trust and how, how trust can be built. What we've found is that a number of the issues that we have in this space are issues that are prevalent throughout research in general. You'll see some of our focus groups are coming up with things that here, this uh, diagram that I liked actually came out of a plant research paper. It wasn't talking about antibodies. It is just, it's just all of these links between different factors that drive irreproducibility problems appear to be similar across domains. And that's why we were linking in with the reproducibility network, because we think we can perhaps start to create the critical mass behind some and evidence some of the, the key changes that need to be made to make improvements across reproducibility, with this being one important factor. Uh, and, I'm just going to jump in here and let you know it's half past, okay? Right, okay. Um, behaviour change and stakeholder engagement. Uh, I, we're, we're, this is what we're doing. I, I, we'll, if anyone's interested in this, get in touch later. This is this is just part of it. And we're we're trying to bring a group of international partners together and ultimately we think uh, stakeholder engagement and, and coordination is important and these are the different areas we're working in stakeholder engagement open data sharing working with publishers and funders to try and change research environment and culture education to support antibody users and finally expansion of, of, of the work that Carl is is doing and going to support about um, there are important, uh, this is an important problem. It's, com it's got a complex set of drivers that aren't easy to, to address. We have to coordinate and engage with stakeholders. And we think that a number of models of working with other stakeholders, such as publishers or uh, manufacturers are, are showing promise. Thank you, I'm sorry for running over. Thanks so much, Hav. That was really, really interesting. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll uh, maybe look at saving questions until the end, if that sounds okay to everybody, just to keep us to time, because we've got a lot to get through. But we do have um, about half an hour allocated at half past two for questions for speakers and for general discussion. So that, that might be a good place for any questions. I can see there is one in the chat there. So um, right now, if it's okay with you, Carl, we'll, uh, we'll move on to your talk about um, the the antibody characterization through open science collaboration um, between people who are interested in biomedical science, data, and research. Um, Carl, I want to say Le Flam, please tell me if I pronounced that wrong, um, is a, um, well, Carl's already mentioned your technical expertise, but you're a scientific director and also a senior scientist at McGill University in, um, in Canada. And you had a colleague who might or might not be joining us, I understand. I'm sorry. Um, so Peter McPherson is on is on the call too. Uh, Rihama UB, who was supposed to give the talk, uh, actually she she's not here today. But um, I, I just want to make sure that you're seeing my screen here. You yeah. are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So okay. Thank you very much for the UK Reproducible Network to give us the opportunity to present our our, our Icarus initiative today. And and what a beautiful introduction by Harvinder and Michael about. <clears throat> about antibodies, their need in biomedical research, and unfortunately how they do not necessarily behave as, as expected. And I do have my own horror story with antibodies when I was studying in the lab of Peter McPherson when I started my postdoc, um, an important disease gene for which most, if not all the antibodies at the time that were used in published paper actually did not recognize the intended target. Um, which literally drove um, the development of of our of our platform here. Um, okay, so I think we understand that there's you know there's a clear antibody liability crisis, and it is important to note that there have been attempts to address this crisis. Private companies, in the most part, tested antibodies and sold their characterization data without having the proper support of the antibody manufacturers. So most, if not all, previous attempts failed. As Harvender and Michael suggested, 
the only way we can really start to address the antibody quality problem is by working together. So this is what ICRIS is all about. Um, ICRIS is an ecosystem where scientists at the Montreal Neurological Institute test the antibodies, donated, provided for free by the antibody manufacturer partners using trusted protocols that we developed in the past years. Um, and we developed them in close collaboration with the manufacturers. So the resulting high quality data are considered at the moment, the gold standard by the scientific community. And now we have several funding agencies supporting the ACRIS initiative. I'll just try to put my latest pointer. Okay. So I will start to introduce the Structural Genomics Consortium since the ACRIS initiative falls into the SGC umbrella. The SGC overall mission is to accelerate the discovery of new medicines, and it does so through um, pre-competitive open science collaboration with key players in the biomedical research community. So pharma, small enterprises, a, a lot of academic groups. And what, they are unique in the sense that they have developed and they follow strict open science principles some are listed here. For example, they publish data rapidly to benefit the scientific community. There's no restriction on use, uh, no intellectual properties, no patents. And at the moment, the SGC has six sites worldwide, two in Canada. There's actually one in the UK, one in Sweden, and one in the US, and one in Germany. All these sites have their unique expertises and SGC scientists all work together to contribute to the development of target enabling packages or TEP. There's one TEP per human protein. Actually, there's, this is in development, that, that's the goal. Within a TEP, you would have a protein structure, a chemical probe, a high quality antibody to allow any researchers to explore, in theory, any human protein. Um, and the ICRIS initiative falls into, uh, is being uh, carried out in, at the SGC Neuro. Um, and I'll credit to Al Edwards, who really helped us develop and scale uh, the ICRIS platform. Okay. Um, so bottom line, ICRIS is part of a larger open science movement with the SGC, with OGA, with the RIDs, that develop high quality reagents, characterize them, or ensure their proper dissemination for the benefit of the biomedical research community. A bit of, um, of an historical perspective, in 2003, the Human Genome Project has been completed, and that was an outstanding achievement. We got the sequence of all human genes, that enables um, genome-wide association studies. Now we can start to address questions like when there's a variant in a, in a particular gene, would that cause a disease or protect to a disease, et cetera. It also gives us the exact number of genes. At the time, uh, it, we thought it was more around 35,000 genes, but now we know it's more around 20, 20,000. This gives us a clear deliverable. Now we know we need to be able to study 20,000 different genes of protein. And at the time, and actually what we found is that only 1.2% of the genome is coding for protein. And five days after the publication of these two seminal papers in 2001, the Times published this cartoon where we see, I don't know, a happy globular protein pushing off stage a double-stranded DNA with the title, Searching for the Real Stuff of Life. And at the time in early 2000, there was a clear boost in protein science with the development of NMR, uh, mass spectrometry. So one would have thought that 20 years later, most human genes would be in the process of being characterized. I was surprised, you might be surprised that actually this is not the case. Most researchers worldwide study 
a small subset of human genes or proteins. So the authors of this uh, article here uh, assigned the number of publication to all human genes, so from zero to 20,000. Here you have the most studied gene or protein. This is P53. Here there's a bunch of genes or proteins with zero publications. And in between you have a large fraction of the human genome that remains poorly characterized. And the, SG the SGC refers to that part of the genome as the dark genome. So, so this refers to poorly characterized proteins or genes. What I think is really important to, to understand is that GWAS studies clearly shows that there are potential disease variants throughout the human genome, okay? Um, thus, there's a lot of human, uh, there's a lot of variants that unfortunately we can't characterize them. We can't understand what they do. We can't study the gene um, because they remain uh, uncharacterized. And this really slows down the development of new therapies. What's getting clear, and Harvinder actually referred to this, tools are driving biology. Here's an example for a, for a family of protein, the nuclear hormone receptor. It's not important, but there's a bunch of proteins within that family. And as soon as there was chemical probes specific to, to some members of that family, in blue here, there started to be um, studies about these proteins. As you can see, 1,000, 2,000 studies um, for these proteins that have a high quality um, chemical probe. So tools are driving uh, biology. So research antibodies are key regions for detection of protein in academic, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical research. Antibodies are tools and should be driving protein biology. And here's now a, quick que a key question, and it answers actually very important too, for the Icarus Initiative. What is the actual coverage of the human proteome by antibodies. Um, so there's various types of antibodies. There's the polyclonal uh, population of antibodies. They suffer from batch to batch variation. These are not considered renewable. And then there's the monoclonal antibodies derived from, from hybridomas, which can suffer from genetic drift, but we consider them as a renewable product. And then there's, and Harbinder mentioned these, the recombinant antibodies that are 100% renewable through time. So when I, when I mention renewable antibodies, I'm really referring to monoclonal antibodies derived from hybridomas or, or derived from the recombinant technology. So at the moment, without doing any work, there's at least 700,000 commercial renewable antibodies targeting 65 of the human proteomes. That looks pretty impressive. But of course the question is, yeah, okay, but what's the proportion of these antibodies that are selective for their intended target? For which application? So we need a mechanism to test them all and identify the good ones. So our common need, and here I'm referring to the overall biomedical research community, we need to identify at least one or two selective, potent, ideally inexpensive, available and renewable antibodies for every human protein for all research applications. And here's our approach, is to characterize the already available commercial antibodies with a focus on renewable to engage with stakeholders in an open ecosystem. By stakeholders here, I'm referring to antibody manufacturers, knockout cell line providers, publishers, granting agencies. Use industry academic endorsed antibody characterization protocols. It took us really three years to develop these protocols, and now we're about to publish them. Disseminate the data openly. Um, I'll come back to our dissemination strategies 
but the RRIDs is a major component of our dissemination strategy. And we're working on this, organize the public and private sectors to generate recombinant antibodies against proteins that are at the moment not adequately covered. Okay, and here's the broad picture of what Icarus uh, is. So we have partnerships with leading antibody manufacturers. Okay, so Adcam, Gentex, Protiting, and so on. There's also two companies that provide in-kind uh, knockout cell lines because our platform is really based on the use of knockout lines to compare signal between parental lines and knockout cells. Um, these manufacturers provide Icarus with, um, with their reagents for free. Then we have the granting agencies, Michael J. Fox, ALS Charities, uh, Simon Foundation and so on, who nominate the proteins to be studied and thus provide granting funding. And then we disseminate the data quickly and rapidly to benefit um, the community. First on Xenodo, we also convert our Xenodo preprints into properly published PubMed index articles using F1000. And in each of our reports, we include RRIDs that are that can be searched through the RRID portal, and Anita will discuss this. At the moment, we publish 80 different reports against 80 different proteins that represent almost 800 antibodies, and the applications we test antibodies for are Western blot, immunoprecipitation, and immunofluorescence. And open science here is a key asset. And I can easily summarize this why just by saying, you know, imagine these 10 antibody manufacturers that do have an antibody against protein X, about against CRPA1, the protein of interest for, uh, of HARP. Each of these companies would need to have their own knockout line, which is costly, it's got around $10,000 to generate a knockout line to then test maybe their only one antibody. Whereas in our side, all we need is to generate one knockout line. We gather the antibodies for the various companies. We test them side by side, and then we release the data on the public domain. Um, we believe that it's a very, very strong mechanism. Um, and there's also other advantages of open science here within the Icarus community, and I'm happy to discuss this uh, a bit later. So here's the overall Icarus platform. So targets get nominated by the manufacturer, by, by the, um, sorry, by the granting agencies. Uh, we look into the nominated protein in terms of are they secreted or intracellular, because this will affect the protocol that we're gonna use to characterize antibodies for. Then we request the reagents, either the knockout lines or the antibodies. If there's no commercial knockout lines, we generate them ourselves. Then we characterize um, the antibodies, we test the antibodies. We always start with Western blot so that we can validate the knockout line that we're using. And what we're seeing is almost 30% of commercial knockout lines are actually not pure products. So there might be a truncated protein in that knockout line, or it's simply not knockout at all. Um, then we prepare our reports and share with our industry partners then we discuss the data during monthly advisory committees. And once we reach our high scientific bar, we publish the data on, um, on Zenodo or on public domains uh, platform. And at the moment, around 20% of all antibodies that we tested, obviously the ones that are subperforming, have been removed from the market. And I think this is really great news. So the manufacturers themselves assess our data in order to take that decision to remove antibodies from their catalog. I, I didn't, I, I don't think it's, I don't know. I, I'm not diving into much of technical 
um, details. I'll give you one example of um, our antibody testing for one application. Um, and, and I don't know, it's an example that we really like at Icarus. Uh, and the data I'm going to show is generated by Reham IUD. So here's, so here I'm going to show antibody testing for Western blot. Here's a schematic representation. I did the drawing on PowerPoint, okay? This is, this is just a drawing. This is the optimal antibody for Western blot, okay? Um, this is the membrane on which the, all human proteins are actually uh, attached to. And the, the antibodies in theory should be able to detect only the protein of interest. And here I'm gonna talk about antibodies targeting a protein called Parkinson, which is involved in Parkinson's disease. And this is a ponceau stain um, uh, representation of, of all the proteins present on the membrane here. And this is the ideal optimal uh, example. And now here's what we observed when we tested the Parkin antibodies um, at Icarus. So all of these Western blots are were blotted with a different antibody, and the name of the antibody is shown above each blot. There are some antibodies from Apgam, Thermo Fisher, Gentex. There's probably, I don't know, six or seven different manufacturers represented uh, here. And as you can see here, there's, you know, we see a lot of bands, and there's no bands that disappears in the knockout. Would we expect that antibody will detect one protein in in the parental lysates and in the knockout with we, where we remove only one protein, we should lose a stenial. Um, this is the most cited Parkin antibody. And sure, I mean, you have to be, have to be really good eyes here to see it, but there's a band that disappears in the knockout, but there's a bunch of non-specific uh, bands here detected with that Parkin A clone. Okay, so, what was interesting here is that one of our manufacturer, in that case, Thermo Fisher, but we have examples with other manufacturers, they assess our data and thought, oh, here's a magnificent market opportunity. They generated after, you know, we presented this screening, two beautiful, high quality, renewable Parkin antibodies, where as you can see, almost look like, you know, the schematic that I did here. It detects specifically Parkin in this application. Okay, so here's our recent uh, findings. Um, so we analyzed the performance of 614 antibodies against 65, sorry, 6,400 antibodies against 65 proteins related to neuroscience. We performed heterogeneous head comparison in Western blood IP and IF, and here's what we learned. So there's already a high coverage of the human proteome by high quality antibody. Here's the coverage uh, from all antibodies. So regardless of their clonality. So for Western blot, it's 86%. Uh, uh, th that's our sample set. So 89% of our sample set is well covered by antibodies for immunoprecipitation and 61% is well covered for immunofluorescence. Um, imaging is always one, is, a, is always the most challenging application. And then regarding renewable antibodies, the, the coverage is still high, but it might be a bit lower than just with overall antibodies. Um, then we compared whether the different classes of, of antibodies would perform differently. And what we found is that recombinant antibodies are indeed superior reagents. When we compare them to monoclonal antibodies or to polyclonal antibodies, they are, for all three applications, performing better, as you can see here. I think what's important here is not, it's not necessarily the fact that they perform slightly better than other types of antibodies. I think what's important here is that recombinant antibodies are adequate for use in any application. And thus, we should be embracing this technology um, and leaving these polyclonal antibodies on, on the side.
Um, and I might end my presentation with on with that slide here. So Harvinder and Mike mentioned the antibody liability crisis, and now we have a pretty good quantification of this. So here's the percentage of antibody um, in gray here that are successful for Western blot. And this portion here are the antibodies recommended for Western blot. So 80% of antibodies recommended for Western blot indeed performs well in our hand for that application. So that's, that's great. For immunoprecipitation, only 58% of the antibodies recommended for that application were indeed specific um, for IP. But what's interesting here is that most of the antibodies actually were just not tested for IP. And we found a large proportion of antibodies that were actually successful for that application. And where it's a bit more, um, where it's distressful, I would say, is by immunofluorescence for imaging, where we failed in reproducing um, the recommendation for 61% of all the antibodies we tested. So yeah, so this is, uh, this is really alarming. That's really highlighting why characterizing the antibodies in your lab for your own experimental setup is crucial. Um, so roughly data dissemination is absolutely important. I mean, we can do all this antibody characterization work, but if no one knows about it, then it's just pointless. So in our, in our report, we do list the RRID, so the unique research identifiers corresponding to each tested antibody. Thanks to these RRIDs, it can link it to the vendor page and on the uh, antibody registry portal. So searching for ICRIS antibody characterization data is definitely facilitated uh, through the use of RRIDs. And I'll let uh, Anita discuss this in more detail. And I would like to thank um, all the ICRIS team. Um, all the science is being done under Bowman in the laboratory of Peter McPherson. Um, and I wanna highlight the work by Reham AUB who really helped us scale up, refine our platform. Um, I'm leaving you with some key questions um, that we can potentially discuss more in, uh, in the discussion panel. And I thank you very much for your attention today. Brilliant, thank you so much, Carl, for a really interesting talk. Now, um, we were speaking just before the seminar about whether people might like to have a quick um, five minute break before we go into the next talk, just to try and um, keep people fresh, focused and full of caffeine if they want to be. Does that sound like a good idea to everybody? Yeah, okay, we've got a quick thumbs up. Thank you very much. Um, nobody's saying no, so we'll take that as read. Shall we have everybody back here at Five past two, does that sound all right? And is that okay with you, Anita? Fabulous, all right. So we can look forward to Anita's uh, talk next and we'll see you all in five minutes. Good time for us to start back and hopefully people have made it back with uh, with their coffee and whatever else they, uh, they might want just now. Um, so I'll uh, take this opportunity to continue introducing um, Professor Anita Banjowski, who has already been um, somewhat introduced by Carl, certainly in terms of some of the very interesting work that you've been doing. Anita's going to speak to us about um, unique identification of research resources, um, RRIDs, research resource identifiers, and automated research assessment as part of her work that she's been doing as CEO of SciCrunch and professor at University of California in San Diego. Um, and please go ahead when you're ready, Anita. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, yeah, I have um, oodles of things on the slide. I just want to highlight a couple of our funders. So um, uh, we were getting a lot of support from um, the Office of Research and uh, in Infrastructure Programs, and that's the Office of the Director um, at the National Institutes of Health. So we're um, very grateful for uh, their support. Um, also, we have uh, recently received a grant from uh, the NC3Rs uh, in the UK uh, for uh, the development, actually it's a contract tender, 
think you call that a tender, um, uh, for the development of uh, some of our automated tools uh, in order to um, uh, automatically enforce uh, the ARRIVE guidelines for animal research. Um, of course, we're very uh, grateful to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and um, various grants that we've received inside the university and outside of the university um, from uh, under other wonderful funders. So um, our IDs do identify antibodies um, and uh, as they identify antibodies, um, we would like to improve how they do. Um, uh, we would like to improve how the um, literature is being represented. So um, I think Virk really discussed this well. I'm not going to go into it other than, uh, you know, Leonard Friedman uh, here in 2017 um, gave a bit of um, a financial um uh, picture of uh, the reproducibility crisis, and he really nailed down the biological reagents, uh, including reference materials such as antibodies, as being the largest part of the uh, the, the reproducibility problem in terms of um, you know what's going on financially uh, with these labs. They're actually you know whether or not you give back the three or five hundred dollars for a particular reagent. Um, at the six weeks of, of researcher time is, is, you know, that can't be returned uh, when you use bad antibodies. So um, the problem, though, um, actually goes deeper than this. It's not just finding bad antibodies versus good antibodies. Uh, at the RID initiative, we asked the question, can you find any antibody in a particular paper? And so um, I had an older slide uh, where, you know, which I've been using for some years. And I, I said, well, you know, let's let us take a look because I think I know what the, the answer is. But unfortunately, the answer is still unfortunately the same. Uh, this is a paper that I pulled yesterday. Um, you can see that, you know, it was published on uh, uh, September 12th. Uh, we are not so far from that. And this is the second paper um, uh, to the search antibody on PubMed Central. Um, the first one, thankfully, did a really nice job uh, highlighting antibodies. The second one did not. So here is the second one. And these authors, um, you know, published just a few days ago, uh, used the following sentence in order to um, tell us which antibody they were using, which is anti-DMT1. And it was obtained from EMD Millipore. Um, and then they put in uh, a, a city where EMD Millipore, um, well, one of the campuses is anyway. Um, but, you know, when we, um, when I looked in, uh, in Millipore Sigma, uh, this is now actually a, a division of Merck, um, for uh, anti-DMT1, I come up with a list of 84 products. Um, eight of them are antibodies, and here they are. Here are the, the top three. Uh, so that means that this paper is effectively not reproducible uh, without going out and emailing these authors in order to determine which actual antibodies they used. Um, so if you actually want to solve this problem of just figuring out which whichever antibody is actually being used, the solution really is that the journal will ask authors to actually provide an RID. This is a research resource identifier which you've heard about before. Uh, in this case, with this journal, um, all of the RRIDs are actually linked. That doesn't happen from the author. It actually happens by the journal. Uh, journals have instructions to their typesetters, uh, which uh, you know uh, basically allow for the RRIDs to be um, linked back to some of our pages. Sometimes they use the identifiers.org um, infrastructure. Sometimes they use the California Digital um, Library infrastructure uh, in order to do that. Sometimes they use our infrastructure one way or the other. All of these reagents are linked back to one of our pages. And um, at that point, uh, it's you're a click away from actually finding all of the other information uh, uh, about this antibody uh, at the manufacturer. So 
what is an antibody or what is an RRID? Um, I like to point out this slide because this slide really tells you that it's not just an identifier, right? Um, the antibody sent or the uh, the RRID syntax for this antibody is in fact that the company or the provider of that particular reagent is the first thing in that syntax. The catalog number is the second thing in the syntax. The lot number is the third thing in the syntax. This is what we suggest to all of our authors. We don't usually get the lot information, but at least we're getting much more of the GAD, um, you know, uh, uh, the catalog number information. And then there is, of course, the global persistent unique identifier. These, these RRIDs are global and unique, um, and they are persistent. And as you saw with that last slide, they can be um, high. Uh, they can be uh, linked to uh, live web pages that tell you, you know, what happened to that antibody. Does that antibody still exist? So um, I'm very excited. We finally have finally <laughs> have released a new um, antibody registry website. So uh, it looks lovely. Um, I'm still not sure that I love all the functionality, but we'll keep working on that. Um, but you can actually. Uh, go ahead and search for something like this catalog number um, to actually find this um, RRID. And you can actually uh, click this little button, which copies the, the um, citation information in here. And uh, that allows authors to get this. Usually the way that people come to us, the authors come to us is they get directed to us by one of about 1500 journals who are now um, have adopted some variety of the policy to um, add RRIDs to their papers. And they direct us, uh, they direct the authors to the PsychCrunch portal, which um, you know then has antibodies and a lot of other things such as cell lines, uh, such as uh, transgenic organisms and um, uh, plasmids and other things. And so if you search then for your um, favorite antibody from your favorite company, um, you will undoubtedly get back to one or a small handful of, um, of records. And once again, we have a, a lovely new website uh, functionality, which just says, hey, copy this thing. Um, so the author can copy this, which is the, the full citation and uh, they can paste it into their manuscript, the papers published, and then anyone, uh, including us, but anyone in the world can actually go in and uh, find all of the different papers um, that have used this uh, unambiguous method of defining <clears throat> their antibodies. So um, a couple of years ago, one of my students um, had looked at uh, a large, we, we did a large text mining study across, uh, I believe this is around 350,000 antibody uh, mentions. So um, note, you know, uh, uh, these things are noted inside of the open access literature. And we looked just at the percentage of these, um, whoops, sorry, uh, percentage of these uh, uh, mentions of antibodies that have nearby a catalog number. So um, if you look across the 1990s, that catalog number is present in about 10, 15% of the papers. Uh, and then there's a very slow and gradual change. Uh, with the RRID project, we started here in 2014. You can see that the rate of um, of finding these um, these catalog numbers was less than 25%. It was somewhere around 20%. And then um, as we had the large journals, including you know, here eLife and Cell, uh, join us in 20, um, 2016, what you're seeing with, um, with those journals is a very large shift from this kind of average uh, percentage of, of um, findability for, for these antibodies to um, somewhere in the 90 uh, percentile. And this 90 percentile, really what it's doing is it is actually shifting the overall literature. So um, we're not sure whether it's because these uh, journals are much more visible or uh, for other reasons, they are starting to shift the culture of how you um, actually should be citing. Now, we have a, a lot of improvement that, um, you know, that remains to be done. Uh, but the more journals that we get um, that actually enforce this effectively, this standard effectively, the more of those citations uh, you get. 
So let me just give you a real quick picture here. We have, you know, we've gone from uh, 85% of the literature that's not reproducible because of um, not being able to find the, the reagents that are being used to now just over 50% not being reproducible for that reason. And um, so we still have quite a bit to go, but we certainly have, I would say, come quite far in uh, in a relatively short time. So we continue to improve the way that um, that authors can interact with RRIDs. Um, and one of our uh, new systems is called SciScore. It um, has been uh, now implemented in about 40 different journals. Um, and this is an automated reviewer tool that um, pings authors with uh, relevant RRIDs or places where those RRIDs ought to be and um, where the tool cannot find uh, the particular antibodies, for example, or cell lines. Um, uh, and uh, it is also uh, part of the, um, it is, you know, it, it generates an MDAR uh, report for science um, authors. Um, it is going to soon uh, uh, generate a report um, for the ARRIVE authors, and of course it uh, generates a star checklist um, for the cell, cell uh, press authors. Um, Chan Zuckerberg has also um, been very uh, generous and have has given us um, uh, some money to push the resource tables into BioArchive. We are currently working with the good people at BioArchive to be able to do that. That should improve, again, um, the visibility of our IDs uh, in addition to um, other uh, methods. So the other question that has been kind of lingering um, for a long time, and so we just started to look at this, is can antibody companies or projects uh, really help us drive this uh, improvement in the scientific literature? And uh, with some money from the um, Office of the Director, we looked at a number of the Office of the Director um, uh, uh, funded projects, including the non-human primate reagent resource, the NHPRR. This is a, um, a renewable antibody uh, project for antibodies that target um, essentially monkey proteins. Uh, a lot of these are used for um, uh, various virology uh, research, including, um, uh, you know, their, their focus is really AIDS. Um, but in any case, what they had done uh, in 2020, they uh, came on board the RRID initiative and um, they started putting the RRIDs right on the front page of every single one of their antibodies. It's fairly prominent here. And what we did um, this year is we went back in the literature all the way back to 2011 to look at how their reagents are being cited. And so what you see here in 2011 is that, um, you know, a little bit over a quarter of the, the time they are um, being cited just as uh, the NHPRR or they're being cited as the name of the PI of this, um, of this project. Um, the other percentage here making up to about 50% is a nickname for the antibody, um, and that nickname could not be tracked down by our curators. So 50% of the time, roughly a little over 50% of the time here, even with uh, a human being looking at these papers, we could not track down which, which antibody was actually being used. Whereas um, the other, uh, you know, almost 50% of the time, we could track down which antibody was being used, but it's being done by name. This is a very difficult thing, very costly thing to, um, to take a look at. So what you're really looking at is we want to get rid of this orange over time, and we want to enhance the blue. Now here is the darker blue, and that means the catalog number is being cited. And of course, the best is this dark blue, which is the RID that is being provided again. These antibodies did not have RIDs before 2020. Um, but what you can hopefully see is that um, in 2020, you know, we still had this split of 
50% not findable, 50% findable, but that really is starting to shift. And it's really starting to shift even th within this year. And um, there are fewer antibodies here that are being, um, that are being, uh, um, uh, you know, counted for this current year at, as we're still in it. Um, but we are seeing a pretty dramatic shift in the number of people that are actually using RIDs compared to these other methods. So um, this gives us a lot of hope. Um, the other thing that we've been working on um, is uh, this, this idea that products can be recalled, products can have notes around them. Um, and in fact, we started to look at this. Uh, so it definitely, this is not, you know, antibodies are not the only things that, um, that have specific problems. Uh, here are some Python scripts, uh, which actually seem to have affected hundreds of studies. There was a, a problem um, with this, and it's a, actually a fairly reasonably um, common co uh, tool in chemistry. Uh, these scripts have been used um, in at least hundreds of studies, but again, it's very difficult to determine uh, whether they were used or not uh, and which version uh, was being used. But um, the problem was that uh, an NMR shift was not being reported correctly because, well, effectively some, some graduate student didn't test their code correctly. Um, now, on the RRID website itself, your, um, if you are an author, you are being asked to find your reagents and you're out being asked to paste those reagents uh, identifiers into a particular paper. But scattered throughout the website, we actually have these um, notes and warnings. So in this case, these Python scripts uh, have a warning associated with them. Uh, this cell line has a warning associated or several warnings. Um, uh, associated with this particular cell line. Uh, this one is partially contaminated. Um, this is an antibody and this has a, a validation data that's available. And as you can see from Ycaros or Icarus, sorry. Sorry, Carl, I really <laughs> I apologize. I always want to call it Ycaros. Um, but in any case, these things are kind of scattered throughout our site. Anita, um, I've been calling it Ycaros for a uh, long time, so. <laughs> yeah. So no problem. I, uh, it's you and me are the only two left with white curls. So. Okay. Well, one of these days I'll say it correctly. Um, but we do know that actually when presented with this information scattered as it is, um, the authors actually do heed the warning. So, you know, we, we are very heartened to say that the authors, the, the, um, you know, the scientists out there, they're trying to do a good job. Uh, when they are presented with a particular problem, they they look at it, they read it, and they um, they act accordingly. Even when it's at the final stages of publishing their paper, they will yank data. Um, and the reason I say that is because we did this um, fairly massive study. This is every single uh, study that was in the open access literature um, that had a cell line uh, associated with this paper. Uh, at the time when we um, pulled this data in 2019, there were 150,000 papers um, that had used at least one cell line in the paper. Um, of those, 16% of that literature was um, affected by the fact that at least one of the cell lines that was being used by those authors had a, um, a a note about it being problematic in some way. Now, sometimes they're fine to use, um, especially if you um, validate whether that cell line is is the right cell line, as you saw with uh, previously, some cell lines are partially contaminated. Um, but the um, when we looked at this in the 634 papers, which at that time uh, were published with RRIDs, where the authors had put in the RRIDs into those papers, only 5% of those, um, of those uh, papers were affected. So that's a 66% drop. And no one had changed the instructions to authors. There was no additional oversight from editorial. Um, there was nothing said about these notes that people should pay attention, but they did pay attention. And in fact, when we looked at all 50 of these papers that had one of these um, uh, uh, problematic notes, 
there was only one paper where we could track down that actually had, you know, quote unquote, knowingly used a um, contaminated cell line. The rest of these are relatively benign notes. Uh, you know, don't use it for this disease, but do use it for this disease. And the paper was actually, you know, using it for the appropriate disease. Um, and what I mean by that is the things like the Hep G2, um, it actually has a note on it. It's a very common cell line. Um, it was initially misdiagnosed when it was taken out of the patient as a hepatocarcinoma. It's in fact, actually a hepatocytoma. Uh, and uh, that note is sitting on that um, on that cell line. So as long as it's used as a generic hepatic cell line or liver cell line, if or it's used as a um, you know as as its proper disease, um, then that the cell line is fine. So just about all of these, except for one study, um, actually you know were able to use um, these cell lines appropriately. Uh, as long as the author knew about this note. It's not the case when the author is not told. Um, so what we've started to do uh, within the last year or so is we actually started to organize better these kind of notes um, about the various things that we know about these RIDs. So in this case, um, this is a, a lovely gene text antibody uh, and what it has on it, uh, and every version of this has it in a slightly different place, but uh, you know, we're trying to, to organize these things a little bit better. Uh, but if you look at the resolver sheet, this is what uh, publishers generally send people to. Um, there's this rating and alert uh, uh, component of this uh, of this record. And this has the uh, rating, the validation rating from Ycaro, um, Icarus, <laughs> one of these days. Um, and if you click on that, you're going to see the record in um, in Biomed Resource Watch. And um, this, again, this website is not great. It is not intended for search. You can search it, but it's it's not intended for search. The, the place where it's intended to, what the thing that it's intended to do is simply store the information. There could be multiple uh, validation reports. There could be multiple notes about a particular uh, research resource. Um, and we want to make that piece uh, accessible and available. So, you know, we continue to allow people to search the RID portal. And for every one of the uh, antibodies, every one of the cell lines and anything else, anyone can report a, a set of information and go through a step-by-step -step procedure um, to leave us a note. There is a curator that um, uh, evaluates those things, making sure that there's no, you know, malfeasance going on it's uh it's a it's a legitimate you know concern we do ask for um either a url um, of evidence or a, a file for evidence for each of those notes and we've received quite a few um you know as as carl mentioned uh the icarus data is all in here but so is the data from about um 12 core facilities, Those, these are like really heavy antibody users, two very large projects, including ENCODE um, and uh, SPARC, which is a, a stimulating peripheral activity and uh, to relief conditions. Um, they use uh, a few antibodies, not as many as, as ENCODE, obviously. Um, but a lot of this data is now available here, and therefore it's being made available through um, the RID portal. So. RIDs are in fact here to serve your needs, but these are not magic. Uh, like most things, they do take a lot of work to be effective. Um, but as NIH asks, you know, NIH has just put together a lovely video um, that's up on their website uh, about RIDs, you know, which information is more useful? Um, is it this kind of poorly structured information or the nicely structured information, um, because the nicely structured information is in fact also very helpful to um, the National Institutes of Health and every, everyone else who's using those, um, those particular reagents. So um, I just wanna thank everyone at our, um, uh, the FAIR Data Informatics Lab uh, these are the, <laughs> these are all the great folks that are doing a lot of the uh, the hard work for us, and of course all of our industry and journal partners. Um, uh, and uh, I would love to stop here, and see if we can take any questions.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anita, for a really interesting talk. So yeah, time for questions, I guess. Um, any questions for anybody specifically for Anita or for the speakers who um, who came before Anita? Uh, we have about half an hour here. And um, just to kind of preface a little bit, um, I know that what um, Harve and Michael and everybody were interested in is thinking about some of the commonalities and difficulties between um, between disciplines and, um, and research and some of the changes in research environment that might be important. So while we can have specific questions for speakers, if people have general points to ask about that or want to start a bit of a debate, that would be wonderful too. Um, I think Peter, um, kind of yeah. has a place in the queue if you would like to ask your question, Peter. For I, about I have a question. And this, I guess, can now be for Anita or for, for Harv or for Michael. Um, you know, what, what what's the best mechanism to um, to push... The, to push the demand for RIDs, to push the demand for validation? Is it at the level of the journals where the journals say, you know, you, you can't publish here unless we meet a certain criteria? Is it at the level of the funders? You can't get a grant unless you convince us that you will, or is it some combination or is it something else? I, I think it's an open question to any of the speakers and not Carl, because Carl and I talk about this enough, but uh, to the other to the other three speakers, is do you guys feel that there's a single mechanism or some combination of mechanisms to force this somehow? Because I think if we don't, I mean, Harv's data or and and talking about the you know the 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 data from the from the from the right. um, from the surveys, you, you know, it, it's almost if you don't force it, it'll never happen. So should it be forced? Who forces it? open question to anyone. I'm going to let Anita talk first because she's actually been working on making this happen. Uh, so yeah. go. Well, um, so Peter, the well, the thing that we found really is that um, every method of forcing, quote unquote, is somewhat effective. So um, it is somewhat effective for um, for the journals to push. Uh, most journals don't make it absolutely required. Um, some journals do, in fact. And so we get far higher, but still not 100% um, of the authors, uh, you know, comply. Uh, our, our author compliance varies between about 1% for some of the journals to about uh, 90%. So we top out at about 90. Mm. Um and there, so it just shows that, you know, 10% of those, you know, staunchly conservative authors are just going to be doing the thing that they've done, done before and darn it, you're not going to change their mind. Um, there are, well, actually, I, I take that back. There are a few journals, um, uh, again, a, a small handful that basically stand on principle and say, you will not publish without an RRID. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, things like, uh, nature protocols, uh, is, is in that list. Um, things like, uh, endocrinology, uh, the journal endocrinology, uh, is in that, um, in that list. And, um, there are a few others, uh, journal of comparative neurology used to be in that list. And now I've noticed that they've kind of dropped off from their, that hundred percent, but you know, that's relatively rare. Um, all of the journals that, you know, do a really good job of enforcing are in that 90% um, pocket. So your, your e-lifes, your cells, your, all of your cell family and, and others. Um, so those, and, but they're, they're super helpful. I mean, that, that gets you to 90% and that 90% is huge because now 90% of those reagents are, are findable. Um, but it's not a hundred. And the thing that, we'd love to ask for people to help us with is pushing from those other other sides right when i talk to people they're like oh yeah this is easy we'll we'll do this um and they they change their whole labs around our ids in in many cases i've talked to editorial boards where um you know they've personally gone in the editors um, have personally gone in and said I'm going to change this in my lab. And now we've got our IDs for everything. Yeah. And that's how they have changed their, so, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah. But it's, it it's, also it's interesting because most of the, most of the editors, I mean, at least in some of the journals are scientists as well, right? Yeah. They're working, you know, and oh, they exactly. understand this problem, I think. And so it's, 
So the, the, the question you asked was the core question I went to Eva Krokow, a behavioral scientist with, was how do you get people to change behavior? So you, you, you've identified an intervention which is demanding behavior change by a, a, a publisher which seems like a you know a, a little bit of a no-brainer but we went to Eva and said so she'd been working on trying to understand how doctors prescribe antibiotics and understand that behavior and change the behavior and there's a whole literature around yeah. behavior change and it's yeah. not e it's not easy so if you think about obesity if you think you know there, there are factors from within the environment there are factors from within a, the individual and What's critical? What I found really surprising is everyone acknowledges this is an important problem and that it needs addressing, and you can even get a degree of consensus that certain actions are important. But you've got to coordinate across publishers, funders, ethics, and it's just it's. Uh, I actually think that a there are several key opportunities. One is CRISPR and the the work that you guys are doing in producing that data, high quality data at faster speeds than before but also the pandemic and being able to hold so many zoom seminars and meetings to to coordinate better we just need to try and you know utilize some of and, and automation from from anita's end is it can we accelerate manuscript checking can we accelerate funding application checking can we accelerate ethical reviews and make take the work out of these difficult and quite challenging uh tasks of checking um and, and i was i mean i'm hopeful perhaps anita you automation and checking i love automation and checking and again you know we've we've now been able to push um the size score into about 40 journals we're a bit above that now um but until we hit a good several hundred journals i think um you're not going to see the kind of shift uh, in the, the journal landscape that um, I think we're going to need in order to really say, all right, everybody's just doing this, you know, because at some point there's going to be that that breaking point. And I think that 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 point is coming. We're, we're getting close. There's enough there in the scientific literature, especially within the antibody literature, where, you know, we're getting to that kind of tipping point where most people are going to do the right thing. And that's the place where, you know, we really need to get to because before that it's the early adopters and we love the early adopters, they're great. But how can we get, you know, more of the funders on board? How can we get more of the, um, of the, the companies on board in order to help push this system and as you saw with this, um, you know, lovely bit of data that we've been able to gather, um, there is definitely a tipping point for each manufacturer, right? And if they're pushing it, if they're, you know, really standing on their heads to say, darn it, you need to do this, um, authors, they can really help drive their community forward. Um, but, you know, that, that takes some doing. And it's it's not super trivial. Um, it definitely takes some doing, though. Um, so I, I'd love, you know, I'd love to see, uh, you know, NIH is is doing a lot on rigor and reproducibility. They have a, 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 you know, authentication document that each grant must submit uh, with each grant, uh, you know, with with each project for validating, you know, all of their reagents, as an example. But how long is it between writing that grant and writing this document and actually writing the paper? It's years. And so there have to be little reminders along the way to, to those people um, who are publishing. And so hopefully, you know, again, I think everyone can do a little bit, right? We can all talk. We can get uh, other people to talk about this stuff. I mean, our IDs are not hard to talk about, trust me. I've done it for years. Um, kind of blue in the face at, at, at saying like, mark your antibodies, mark your antibodies, make sure you just put those little numbers in there because they really help. Um, modeling seems to be another thing as in, if it, so I think, Carl, I think you had how many manufacturers working with you to start out with? Was it three or four? And then, you you know. Yeah, it started with three indeed. Yeah, and, and, it, and it just starts a cascade. And, and when it comes to individual behavior, um, uh, Eva, um, 
she, she has uh, antimicrobial um, stewardship champions. So they, they identify and reward someone for, for, for good practice, highlight that to the community, and it kind of brings people with you. There's, there are social norms, and unfortunately for now, not, well, perhaps RRID is becoming a social norm, but doing a robust validation and sharing it is not yet a social norm in our space. And I, I think, you know, the behavior change wheel policy, we need to work with other people who understand how to move levers and get to the levers of power in order to, to drive the necessary change. Um, Chris, Christina uh, Tafali, uh, she said, uh, I think it would be important to ensure that we encourage undergraduate MSc, PhD students to use the RID, et cetera. Yeah, and, 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 and just um, early career people and PhD students want to do good science and, they, and they're quite open to change and education. And, you know, I, I think perhaps a mission statement should be the next generation of scientists who are coming through now will use our RIDs, they will perform a good validation experiment, and they will link that data to an RRID. Um, and that, that does require some culture change in PIs as well. And that's something I'd love other people's comments. How do we get the, the PIs to support this upcoming generation to, to do the right thing? Absolutely. Um, there's a couple more uh, questions in the chat. I can read some of them. Thank um, you. So here's one from Sarah. Community drives um, like ProMap are important too, I think, uh, especially in terms of drawing new people in by making the best practice clear and easy to follow. Uh, fully agree with that. Um, one of the biggest issues regarding engagement in my area of psychology, it's a different discipline, but it's people knowing where to start uh, which is an open research and reproducible work and ProMap. Uh, there's a link there uh, for anybody who's looking at ProMap. So yeah, uh, we, we love psychology um, over in the RID project. We've actually worked with OSF on um, some Department of Defense work, uh, which was completely open, actually, strangely enough. It was all around reproducibility of, um, of science, including um, psychology. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's a, it's a problem with every single field and discipline and it needs to be solved within that field and discipline. And, uh, Sarah, if you want to use RIDs for psychology, we have a lot of instruments listed in the tools section and we have, um, software tools, obviously that are rel highly relevant, obviously antibodies less relevant to you. Um, does anybody have a ID last year, Anita? So um, fortunately, in this case, I know what you're talking about, although I must admit a lot of this uh, webinar has been learning for me. <laughs> and it's, it's just lovely. I'd, I'd love to bring more people from different communities in together because some of the solutions can be applied to more like Anita's clearly leading on this is the solutions are not all antibody specific or uh, code specific. They are global solutions to global problems that are driven by similar global phenomenons, you know, um, publish or perish. Now, you, you want to be competitive and you want to be productive, but you also want to be robust. And there needs to be some mechanism whereby if your work 10 years down the line hasn't made an impact because it wasn't robust, that doesn't have any impact on someone's career as things stand. And I, I, yeah. Um, fantastic. Um, I will link in with Nikki um, from the UK in uh, Research Integrity Office. We're, we're talking to the Re UK uh, Re Research Integrity Office. Um, we, we spoke to, what was his name? Um, uh, pa Parry was his surname, but we'll get in touch. Thank you so much for mentioning the Animal Materials Working Group. An animals is an important issue, but uh, maybe I'll, if someone wants to, we'll, we'll hold off on the animals for a bit. No, um, animals are used to make antibodies. Animals are used in, in this research. Um, and we're trying to understand how many animals are used. It's not, it's not easy, but is anyone, um, I, I, I wonder if, if there's an opportunity here to, to reduce 
uh, the, the the number of an, animals we use in producing antibodies that aren't fit for the purpose, or in experiments using antibodies that are not fit for the purpose. Um, Could RID Anita inform users about whether it's a animal derived antibody or not? Could we have? This yeah, kind of actually. So, so I'm on the um, uh, scientific advisory board for a project called Comp. Uh, KOMP, which is the Knockout Mouse Project. Um, there's a huge amount of data um, across the, essentially it's it's a project to knock out every gene out of a mouse. Um, and this is there to inform um, animal models uh, for, uh, for all of the human diseases. There's uh, a lot of talk there in, in terms of the dark genome, the dark uh, portion. I, I, I was really happy to see um, that in your talk, Carl, um, because really there's a there's a huge number of things that we haven't really looked at yet. It's, it's because the reagents are not quite as plentiful. Um, the papers are certainly not plentiful um, and a lot of the models are not plentiful. But with COMP, we at least do have the mouse models for a lot of these. Um, they have been created, they might have to be, you know, pulled out of cryo storage. Um, but those are things that are really ripe to study. Uh, we have a lot of these targets that, you know, really have hit a, a really small number of proteins and we're all studying those. We need to look in, a lot more broadly. Um, the animals themselves, um, have RIDs. Uh, we've been working very closely with, um, our office of, uh, uh, resources, research resources um, at NIH and all of the different stock centers in the US. Um, but there are lots of stock centers within uh, the EU. Most people have kind of a, a community hub in uh, generally one of the countries. And those community hubs are really important to kind of organize some of that data. They're often the providers of those persistent unique identifiers, which we then stick an RRID in front of and say, hey, you can also, you know, resolve this through the RID mechanism. Um, so, you know, I would really encourage the use of the model organism uh, community resources who have uh, a tremendous deep knowledge in, in terms of all of this. Our, our colleagues at um, Mouse Genome Informatics Project have actually just completed a really cool project where they found a bunch of models um, that are not models of a particular disease. So you imagine this as, okay, here's a mouse, um, it knocks out a particular gene or it tweaks a particular gene. We know that this gene in the human is uh, associated with a particular disease, let's say uh, Parkinson's or some other disease, and yet that model is insufficient at uh, being able to describe that model. It doesn't recapitulate the, um, the phenotypes. So that is an important set of data that hasn't been you know, widely distributed. And so we're working right now with uh, our colleagues at MGI to expose that data also through Resource Watch so that when people are looking for these animal models, they say, hey, this one doesn't recapitulate the disease you know, maybe that model recapitulates a different disease, but at least there's no data available uh, or negative data available. You know, these these negative data are just really, they come up again and again in different contexts, right? This Michael's does not, sitting on, yeah. <laughs> it's just like everybody wants to say, this works, everything works, but it doesn't, right? We we need to get more of those negative examples. And there's a large number of these um, these quote unquote, not models that are actually, uh, that have been defined. So we're, we're really grateful for the, the wonderful work of um, of the MGI uh, curators to be able to give us that um, that information. Maybe we could, ask, maybe we could ask Nikki, um, if, if you don't mind, Nikki, um, to just talk about how you know, the, the, the animal usage um, is so is you know how maybe animal usage is and it can drive part of because we we're firm believers in in the idea that we should move towards recombinant antibodies that reduces animal usage um you know i i don't know you but 
you're an expert, I think, on this area. Could you maybe just weigh in on that? Would you mind? Uh, so I have been part of this working group, but um, I'm not 100% up to speed with it um, at the moment. But in terms of animal use and antibodies, there is significant concerns because of the reproducibility, because it's a biologically active reagent. Uh, there's also ethical concerns. So for a long time, UK funders have, um, and indeed across Europe, there's been discussions about uh, banning or uh, the use of uh, animals to generate monoclonal antibodies because of the ascites and they are can cause severe suffering to uh, animals and obviously there are alternative techniques now uh, and um, it, it looks from um, some initial studies and some of the validation work that's been going on that perhaps those antibodies that are produced using non-animal methods uh, maybe initially from hybridomas but then completely uh, non-animal uh, methods are, are uh, proving to be more reliable, more reproducible, more specific to the targets, uh, more helpful to the research community. Um, so that's kind of why I joined the session today, just to see what where the conversation is at, um, to see whether there's kind of uh, strings we can start pulling together. So I think there definitely is a potential scope for you know, production opportunities in that regard. And I can see Anthony's got his hand up now. So I would possibly recommend handing over to him because he's more expert on this topic than I. Thank you, Nikki. This was, this was, that was very important. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Nikki. I wouldn't necessarily say uh, I'm um, expert in this field but in any way, shape or form, but um, it's been a really interesting discussion, actually, because, um, I mean, the work is is known well to us um, through interactions we've had with with Harv and um, Carl and some of the colleagues. And so I, I work for the National Centre for the Three R's in the UK. Um, we have a programme of work where we are looking at how we can actually accelerate the wider adoption of non-animal derived antibodies to address some of these issues that we've been talking about today. Um, and, you know, this is a pretty mature field. It goes beyond just recombinant antibodies, but looking at different affinity reagents like aptamers, um, apamers, and there are many other different types that are out there. Um, and, you know, just listening to the challenges that have been raised and the issues that have been raised, I mean, these are all challenges that we as an organization have faced um, pretty much since we were established in trying to get some of that behavior change to adopt some of these approaches that you know, on the face of it, you'd feel as a no brainer in terms of better quality science, reducing the use of animals, you know, we're not asking for massive changes in what people are doing. But that the change is hard, you know, people don't like to change, there has to be that evidence base, it has to be easy, there has to be champions, there has to be drives from the top, there has to be drives from the bottom, you know, as you know, Harvard suggests, everything has to come together to be able to do that. And, you know, I think there are as I said, there are some real synergies in what we see as some of the challenges of driving the adoption of these non-animal um, derived antibodies and affinity reagents that you guys are finding in terms of using good quality validated reagents. Um, and I think there's some really nice opportunities to, to you know, really look at how we can work together more as communities to um, have a more joined up voice and a stronger voice, single voice to, to have some of this change. And I'm, I'm looking forward to a chat I've got with Harv tomorrow about how we can take some of this forward. Um, I, I think um, Carl put me in touch with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Her, her name was Nicole. I can't remember. Well, she she leads a program that's all about tools and the importance of high quality tools in research. And I think there's a lot of uh, synergy with the NC3Rs in, 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 that, in that focus on tools and technologies. And they had some fantastic stories of when they started out, uh, They've tracked some of the outputs from the programs that they funded and found that tools were a problem and actually thought this is a market space from a funding organization perspective where we can have a lot of impact by de-risking discovery. And actually, animal-derived products are inherently uh, heterogeneous. And that's, you know, the, 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 there's a bit of synergy between the two approaches, the NC3Rs approach, the uh, Michael J. Fox approach. One of the things we want to do is put Michael J. Fox in the room with the other stakeholders, i.e., uh, not Michael J. Fox, uh, the, the, the foundation, but uh, mm -hmm. just, just you, you know, get them to tell the story 
to the publishers, the, the, the funders, to get them to say why they've got this emphasis on, on tools and quality. And, and perhaps that could help coalesce the community to say this is this is important enough not only for us to agree but to coordinate and, and, and coordination is not easy and uh, you guys know that much better than i do i'll just add that michael j fox although the organization's american michael j fox of course canadian <laughs> Been quite a North America uh, centric discussion. Uh, we, we need to get some <laughs> of our, our EU colleagues uh, to, to join us. Um, uh, I see, I, I didn't mention, um, but Janice has kindly joined the call. Janice is from the Antibody Society and they helped organize uh, the meeting in Asilomar um, that I believe Anita was at. I, I'm sure some of you guys might have been there. And I, I'd like to, I, I'll try and post in the chat an excellent documentary. And webinar series so the documentaries by uh, Mike Kimoto who, uh, and it's just really nice uh, Anita it was on it and um, it really tells the story much better than I'll ever be able to and um, and then the webinar series uh, by, by the Antibody Society for those of you who are actually biomedical researchers really is a deep and good dive in, into some of the uh, disagreements as well that we have about how to do antibody validation but it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent uh, view. I'll, I'll just paste them now. All right. As well as just said, I think we're getting quite close to the end of our time. We're finishing at three. So I guess, are there any last questions from anybody before we close for the day? Yeah. Just thank you so much for, um, for being here, for listening to to this uh, group of, of of very nice and very excited uh, speakers, uh, Har, <laughs> others especially. I mean, you're really, we need this. This is what we absolutely need. This is that grassroots effort, uh, in my opinion, that, that has to be part of that whole story of how do you change uh, behavior uh, throughout um, and thank you and Carl and Peter and uh, and and um, NC3Rs and Antibody Society that I, I had all of, all of my thank you slides got whizzed over. Um, but it was just we're, we're creating um, we're just trying to create enough of a grouping, bottom up, top down, to make this uh, you know let's make a change. We can do it. That's a really nice note to finish on. So I guess if we can just uh, thank Anita, Hav, Michael, Carl, and um, you, Karen, and Will for putting all of this together. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for a really interesting afternoon. Sure. Thank you.